Hi, I'm Mia Ree of Good Elephant Pottery, and I'm here to teach you how to mix a glaze from raw materials. This is the very first step into the subject of glaze making. Glaze making is a huge subject, so I'm not going to try to teach you the entire subject in one video. I'm just here to explain the first steps. Once you complete everything that you see in this video, you will find that you are now standing in the huge space of this subject and that you feel comfortable standing in it because you will have gained the tools and the knowledge needed to continue to explore the rest of the space. So if you feel like there is a barrier preventing you from entering this subject, I'm going to remove it and shepherd you inside. I spent my early pottery years in a community studio, but then I reached a point where I was ready to move out and into my own studio. But I didn't know anything about glaze making and I had to teach myself. This is the video I wish I could have watched when I was at that stage. I'm not gonna dumb down this subject for you because I think that's what you need because I don't think you need that. I'm gonna explain things as accurately and thoroughly as I can. And I think many of you will reach the end of this video thinking, I'm ready to try this now. So why is this important? In an era where you can buy commercially made glazes that are ready to use, from the point of view of a person who has been studying pottery for about 30 years, made by a whole range of people from student beginners all the way up to world-class masters. From my perspective, a potter who is not making their own glazes has a pretty low ceiling in terms of the quality they're going to achieve. Commercial glazes and glazes made for you in a community studio are really beneficial when you're in the early stages of your pottery life and you'd rather focus on pottery making instead of glaze making. That's totally fine. In fact, I recommend that you do it in that order. But at some point you're gonna hit that ceiling where your pots are starting to become good, but your surfaces are not improving. There are two qualities that I think are essential for great pottery, originality and ownership. As long as you are still just selecting from glazes that other people made for you, your work is not going to express those two qualities. Those of you who have spent time in a community studio know that sometimes you can see work that comes out of them and honestly not know who made it because everyone's work has the same general look and that's because they're all using the same glazes. And as for commercial glazes, I mean, they all look the same to me. <laughs> I can see a photo of a random person's pot on the internet and automatically know that the glazes are commercial because they all have a similar vein running through them that's easily recognizable to a trained eye. Also, when it comes to commercial glazes, those are often sold in pint containers, which means you need to brush them on. Brushing is the least reliable method for applying glazes. It's hard to control thickness and evenness when you're brushing. When you make your own glazes, you can make batch sizes that are big enough for dipping and pouring, which will give you much better results. And the last thing I'll say about commercial glazes is for those of you who have ambitions to start a business with your pottery, commercial glazes do not make sense from a business standpoint because they are so expensive <laughs> compared to making your own. The cost benefit is not there. Or let's say you love a certain commercial glaze and it's in high demand with your customers and then the company who makes it decides to discontinue it or change it. You can't run a business when something that important is out of your control. I recommend being prepared to take notes because there are a lot of details that you need to keep track of. And taking careful notes is part of glaze making anyway, so you might as well start now. Or just watch this whole video through once without taking notes and then watch it a second time while writing everything down. I'm starting the instruction with some footage of me making test tiles. This is footage from another video of mine titled Glaze Like a Pro. In that video, I explain that you can't really be a good glazer unless test tiles are part of your workflow. And the same thing goes for glaze making. You need to have test tiles on hand in order to do it. Now, there are lots of methods to make test tiles, but this one is my favorite. 
I roll out a large slab and then I cut it into strips that are about three and a half inches by one and a half inches in size. I will sometimes take a stamp to texturize the front surface of the tile. And then I'll take these strips and I'll fold them so that they stand upright by themselves. It only takes a few minutes to make a few dozen tiles using this method. And once you're done with this, you just need to let them dry and then put them into your next bisque firing. And then you just need to store them until you're ready to use them. Glaze making does require a lot of tools. And some of these need almost no explanation and some of them need a lot of explanation. So I'm just gonna go through these one at a time and give you as much information as I can. So like I've already said, you need a notebook to write everything down in. Glaze making involves so many details and numbers that if you're not writing everything down, it would be impossible to remember everything that you're working on. And just for fun, I'm gonna show you all of my notebooks. This is from about 20 years worth of glaze making here in my studio. I've gone through three whole notebooks and I'm working on a fourth one. And all of the pages that contain tape flags, these are pages that have recipes that I consider finished recipes. So here's a good way to visualize 20 years worth of glaze making for me. All right, and this next tool is maybe the most important piece of glaze making equipment that you need. You need a scale. Glaze materials are measured by weight, not by volume. So you need something to be able to weigh your materials with. And the good news is that these small digital scales have become really affordable and accessible over the past few years. So this is not an expensive buy. Um, the parameters that I'll give you though is to look for a scale that can measure down as small as 0.1 grams. And at the high end, it needs to measure at least 2000 grams. Okay, so look for a scale that goes from 0.1 grams to 2000 grams. And you can go above 2000 grams if you want. It's not necessary, but you can. Uh, most of the ingredients you need to weigh out will be less than 2000 grams. Um, but in my studio, I have one recipe where I need to weigh out 3000 grams for one ingredient, but it's not a problem. I just weigh out two 1500 gram portions instead, and I don't have to do it very often, so it's not a problem. Um, the one ad piece of advice that I'll give you is to look for a scale that comes with an adapter and can be plugged into an outlet because that makes it a lot more convenient when you're working. Uh, most of these scales are battery powered and that's not a problem unless you run out of battery <laughs> in the middle of a glaze making session, which kind of sucks. If you have one that plugs into the wall, you don't have to worry about that. So for convenience, I recommend looking for one that has an adapter. Now to make sure that your scale is always accurate, I also recommend getting a set of calibration weights so that you can occasionally test your scale to make sure that it's still measuring accurately. And I bought a whole set of these weights and the, these are the only ones that I actually use on a regular basis. This is 500 grams, 200 grams, 20 grams, and one gram. So make sure when you're buying calibration weights, you have at least those four. So this is another really important piece of equipment, which is a respirator so that you can protect your lungs from all the dust that you're going to be kicking up when you're mixing glazes. And this is another thing that has become really accessible and affordable in recent years. These are not expensive. They're really lightweight and they're comfortable to wear them. So it's not that hard to have to wear a respirator while you're working. Um, look for P100 filters and also this number 2091. 2091 refers to a filter that will um, block out dust particles, but it's not strong enough to, to block out odors. But in glaze making, you don't have to worry about odors, you just have to worry about dust. Next, you're gonna need some sieves. A sieve is basically a plastic ring that's shaped like a bowl and it has a screen in the middle of it. And uh, sieves come in a few different mesh sizes, but really the only one you need are 80 mesh sieves. So these are both 80 mesh sieves. Um, there might be some specialty glazes out there where you need a different size mesh, but um, in 20 years of glaze making, I've only ever used these two and I've never needed anything else. Now I do think you need to get two different sizes of 80 mesh sieves. So this one is what I call a full size sieve. It fits into a five gallon bucket. 
and this small one is used for making test size batches of glaze. And this is just an assortment of various scoops that you're going to need. You're going to need a whole bunch of scooping type devices and this is just for transferring material from one place to another. Um, I use a lot of these food service containers for this. I also use a lot of measuring cups because these handles are pretty handy. And then I also use a lot of plastic spoons. There are times when you're going to want to move like tiny amounts of material at a time and these spoons are great for that. So when I'm making test size batches of glaze, I like to use these plastic cups to do them in because they're the perfect size. This size will hold a 100 gram batch of glaze and this size is perfect for a 200 gram batch of glaze. And because these cups do not come with lids, I use Glad press and seal wrap in order to make lids for these cups. And this is an area where you can substitute any small containers for this purpose. If you want to reuse food containers or things like that, that would be great. Um, as long as you can fashion lids for them, it's going to work. This is an underglaze pencil which I don't find useful for making pots with, but um, it's perfect for labeling test tiles. And this is a small silicone spatula, which is used when making test size batches of glazes, and you'll see how I use this. These last tools are all related to making full size batches of glaze. Um, in addition to the sieve, which I already mentioned as being the, the sieve for full size batches, you're also going to need a container for weighing out all of your ingredients. And I like using this stainless steel bowl for that because nothing sticks to it and it's really easy to clean. And I've been using this for 20 years. You're also going to need a really sturdy pair of rubber gloves. So these are the best rubber gloves I've ever found for glaze making. They are really long and they're really sturdy and they go up all the way above my elbows and they cling to my arm above the elbows. So um, where did I find this really awesome pair of rubber gloves? I found these at the Korean grocery store in the section where they sell kimchi making equipment. So yes, these are kimchi making gloves and they're also the best glaze making gloves that I've ever owned. Um, speaking of the kimchi making department in the Korean grocery store, this pail with the side handle is something I also found in that section of the store and you're going to see how I use this pail later on. You need some kind of measuring device for measuring water. This pitcher holds exactly one gallon of water. It also has liters on the other side. Sometimes I work in gallons, sometimes I work in liters. So you need a pitcher that will uh, cover you for either gallons or liters. This is a hydrometer. A hydrometer is used for measuring the specific gravity of liquids, which is another way of saying thickness. So we're going to use this to measure the thickness of our glaze after we make a full size batch of it. Now hydrometers come in a few different scales and this one ranges from 1.4 to 1.65 specific gravity. So that's the scale that I recommend that you buy. Um, there might be cases where you need a hydrometer that measures a different scale than that one, but this one is the typical range for most glazes. And finally, you'll need some larger buckets to make full size batches of glaze. This is a two gallon bucket and this is a five gallon bucket. And a two gallon bucket will hold about a 2000 gram batch of glaze and a five gallon bucket will hold 5000 to 8000 grams of glaze. And just make sure that whatever buckets you're using for this, that they come with lids. Let's talk about materials for glaze making. There are a hundred or more ingredients that potters will use in glazes, which is way more than I'm ever going to try. But in my studio, this shelf and this shelf, these are all glaze making ingredients. So if you're new to glaze making, you do need to start to think about how you're going to store all of the ingredients that you're going to end up collecting. Now of all of the materials that you see here, there are only about six of them that I actually use on a regular basis now. 
Um, so my advice to you as a new glaze maker is to only buy things in small quantities. These are all one pound or five pound quantities. And that way it's not that hard to store all of the things that you're gonna end up collecting. Don't buy anything in a larger quantity until you're sure you're gonna use it a lot. So these are the things that I buy in large quantities. That means I buy these in 20 pound or 50 pound amounts. And like I said, I didn't start buying any of these in large amounts until I was sure I was gonna use them all the time. And also notice that as much as possible, I use clear storage boxes for my glaze ingredients and that is so I can always see how much is left from the outside. If you wanna get further into the material side of things, I highly recommend this book, The Ceramic Glaze Handbook by Mark Burleson. This book does a great job of explaining all of the materials used in glaze making, what they are and what function they serve inside of recipes. It explains things in plain English and visually, which makes it really easy to understand. These are the best explanations that I found. And when I was learning how to make glazes, I found myself looking stuff up in this book all the time. <laughs> it really helped to get me where I wanted to go. So again, this is the Ceramic Glaze Handbook by Mark Burleson. This is the recipe that we're going to make today. You're going to want to write this down in your notebooks. Next to the name of the glaze, I like to note the temperature and the atmosphere that the glaze is intended for, and also a brief description of what the glaze is supposed to look like. And that's because if I share this recipe with anyone, this information needs to travel with it. Most glaze recipes, not all of them, but most of them can be divided into two sections. There's the base recipe and the additions. The base recipe determines all of the substantial qualities of the glaze, such as what temperature it will melt at and whether it's glossy or matte and how durable the glaze is. The additions determine the more superficial features of the glaze, such as whether it's opaque or transparent, and the color. The reason I chose this recipe for this lesson is because these are all very commonly used glaze ingredients, which means I'm not asking you to buy anything that you're not likely to use again. Also, this is a really solid, reliable, semi-matte base recipe. It's great for foodware because it's really durable. So it's a nice recipe for everyone to have. Down the road, you can take this base recipe and replace the additions with a whole lot of other possible combinations to create semi-matte glazes in other colors. In my studio, I only use three base recipes, a semi-matte, a dry matte, and a glossy. And all of the glazes that I use start with one of those three base recipes. Anytime you're going to make a new recipe for the first time, you must always start with a small test batch. Making a full size batch of a brand new recipe is, I'm just going to be blunt, it's dumb and it's crazy. <laughs> if you do that, that means you don't understand glaze making. And it also means that you're impatient, which is not a good quality for a potter. Even if this is a recipe that you've seen someone else using successfully, if you are making it for the first time, it might not turn out the same. There are way too many variables between every pottery studio and every kiln that you cannot assume it will turn out the same. Making a full size batch to begin with is a good way to waste a whole bunch of your materials. And it will also be very frustrating and discouraging. On the other hand, these little batches are quick and easy to make and easy to let go of if they don't turn out right. So the numbers in this recipe should be viewed as grams. We're going to use grams to measure everything. In most cases, again, not all cases, but in most cases, the base recipe will add up to 100 grams and the additions will be a few grams on top of that. So I'm going to turn on my scale and make sure it's set to measure in grams, 
Then I'm going to use one of my small plastic cups as a receptacle on the scale. Then I'm going to tear the scale back down to zero. And now I'm ready to start weighing ingredients, which means it's time to put this on now. Okay, so the first ingredient I need is ferro frit 31.95 and I need 20 grams. So here is my frit 31.95. And you'll remember I talked about scooping devices back when I was talking about tools. I typically keep one larger scooping device and one plastic spoon inside all of my bins of materials. So e inside each of these bins, I have their own, each of these bins has their own dedicated scooping devices. And that way I never have to wash these <laughs> because they only ever touch one thing. So I need 20 grams of this frit. And because I'm working in such small amounts, I'm going to use the spoon to move it into this cup. And I'm going to keep going until I hit 20 grams on that scale. Okay, so I just went past it. It's 20.3, so I'm going to remove a little bit. All right, so now I'm at 19.9. I'm going to get as accurately as possible. If you're off by 0.1 or 0.2, that's fine. Oh, there's 20 right there. If you're off by 0.1 or 0.2, that's fine for a test batch, but you want to get as accurate as possible. Okay, so my 20 grams of frit 3195 go into here. Um, sometimes you need to keep re-tearing the scale as you move from one ingredient to the next, but in this case it seems to still be on zero. So my next ingredient is wollastonite, and I need 29 grams. So again, I'm taking a scoop of wollastonite and a plastic spoon. I've gone a little bit over. I'm at 29.4, so I'm going to try to remove a little bit. All right, there, 29.0. And then this gets added to the first ingredient. All right, next comes Nepheline cyanite, which all potters just refer to as Neph Cy. Neph Cy is always used in small quantities, at least in my experience, so this is something I store in a smaller box. And I only need four grams, which is a small amount, so I'll just stick to my, my little measuring spoon here. I'm at 3.9 right now, so I'm going to try to add just a tiny bit more. Oops, went over by a little bit. Okay, 4.0.
So next comes EPK, which is an acronym for Edgar's Plastic Kaolin, which is a brand name of Kaolin. It's probably the most widely used brand of Kaolin out there. EPK, I need 30 grams. Okay, I'm at 29.5, so I'm going to go slowly from here. All right, that's 30.1. 30.1 is probably fine. Oops, I went a little too far. It's back to 30.1, but I'm going to leave it that way. Okay, and the last material in my base recipe is silica, and I need 17 grams. Oops, 17.5. Back it up a little bit. Okay, that's 16.9. 17.1, which I'm going to stick with. Okay, so now I'm moving on to my additions. I'm going to re-tear my scale because the additions all come in very small amounts. The first one I need is rutile, and I need 6 grams of rutile. Rutile is a really terrific ingredient. It's actually mostly titanium, but it's stained with a little bit of iron, and that's what gives it this tawny brown color. Titanium is an opacifier, so this ingredient is what's going to make this glaze opaque. And then the little bit of iron that's mixed in here is going to tone down the cobalt and the copper. Cobalt is a really, really intense, like, primary blue color, but the iron in the rutile is going to mute that down a lot. All right, so I need six grams of rutile. Five point five, five point six, so I'm getting close. Five point nine. Sometimes my scale takes a few seconds to decide, but in, the, in this case, I think it really is stuck on five point nine, so let me add a little more. Oops, 6.2, a little too far. When it comes to additions, you do want to be really as accurate as you can, like down to the decimal point. Let me take some back out. All right, 5.9, so let me put a little bit back in. All right, now, 6.0. Okay, so the next ingredient is copper carbonate, and I need three grams. Copper, as, you'll, as you're going to see as soon as I get this lid off, 
is the ingredient that potters use to make green glazes. So I need three grams of copper carbonate. So this is the green component of this glaze. That's 3.2, so I need to back it up a little. That's 3.1. All right, 3.0. All right, and then... This is our last ingredient, it's cobalt carbonate. Cobalt is the ingredient that potters use to make blue glazes, and even though it looks like a, like a soft lavender color in its powdered form, this is a really, really intense blue. You have to use it in tiny, tiny amounts. I'm going to tear the, tear the scale again just to make sure that it's accurate. And um, for my particular scale, I don't know how many scales this is a problem for, but when I'm measuring a really tiny amount, like 1.5 grams, my scale tends to get a little less accurate at those low numbers. So what I do is I will take my 20 gram calibration weight and put it on the scale with the cup. So the scale actually says 20 gram, 20 grams right now. And then I will add cobalt carbonate to my cup until it reads 21.5. And my scale has a much easier time measuring the difference between 20 and 21.5 than it does measuring the difference between 0 and 1.5. And again, cobalt is so intense and so strong, it's important to be as accurate as possible when you're measuring cobalt. All right, I'm at 21.1, so I'm close. 21.4, so now I'm really close. All right, now I'm at 21.6, so I need to back it up a little. Okay, there, 21.5. So now it's time to add water to this test batch. Now this is something that most glaze recipes do not come with, and that is the correct amount of water. And I don't understand why most recipes don't include this because the thickness of a glaze can totally change its appearance. So when I'm working on a recipe, I always try to determine the correct amount of water and then include that as part of the recipe. So for this 100 gram batch, I'm going to use 125 grams of water. 125 grams is my default starting point whenever I'm trying a glaze for the first time. This is the average amount of water that I use in all of my glazes. Some of my glazes use less, some of my glazes use more, but this is the average and it's a good starting point. For a 100 gram test batch, I will weigh the water on the scale, just like the other ingredients. It's really easy to measure a small amount of water accurately this way. And then when it's time to make a full size batch, this amount of water can quickly be converted into liters because a gram and a milliliter are the same thing. I mean, scientifically speaking, they're not exactly the same thing, but for all intents and purposes in the context of glaze making, you can consider them to be the same thing. All right, so I'm gonna turn my scale on. 
make sure it's set to grams. I'm using the same cup as I use to weigh out all the ingredients and that way any of the materials that are stuck to the inside of the cup, those are going to get rinsed down in the water and become part of the test batch. So I'll put the cup back on the scale, tear it out to zero, and now I'm going to add 125 grams of water to this cup. Okay, I went a little over, I went to 126, so I'm gonna use a spoon to help get some of that water back out. All right, that's 123.9, so let me put some back. 124.9. 1. 125.1. <laughs> Oops, I went a little back a little too far. Okay, there, 125.0. I'm gonna sprinkle the dry ingredients on top of the water. The dry always goes on top of the water so that the particles start to fall down through the water and they start to hydrate themselves. You don't wanna pour the water on top of the dry ingredients because it'll be really hard to stir up all of the dry ingredients from the bottom to get them up into the water. But pouring the dry on top of the water makes it really easy for them to start combining with each other. All right, so now that most of the dry ingredients have sunk down, I'm gonna start to stir this. And now you're gonna start to understand why stirring alone is never enough to incorporate these dry ingredients into water. The particles just want to clump together and by stirring, you're not gonna get them to break up. And this is the whole purpose of using a sieve in glaze making. By taking this mixture and putting it through the screen of a sieve, this is, where, this is how you get all of those particles to separate from each other and then form into a much smoother consistency in the water. So, I'm gonna put this sieve on top of my empty cup and pour this mixture into the bowl of the sieve, scrape out as, as much of it as I can. And then I'm going to use my silicone spatula to just encourage and, you know, sort of wiping the dry ingredients against the screen, which encourages them to go through. And as they go through the screen, they're going to break apart. Okay, and there's usually some clumps stuck to the bottom of the sieve afterwards, so those also need to be scraped. And put into this mixture. All right, so now, if I stir this now, you can already see how much smoother it is compared to what it was before. Now, most glazes need at least two sievings. And some glazes need more than two, but this one looks like, since it's already almost smooth now, I think it looks like two is gonna be enough for this one. So I'm gonna put this back in the sieve. Oops, I'm losing a little bit. <laughs> and then you can see how much faster it goes through the sieve the second time because it's so much smoother than it was the first time. And this time there's almost nothing stuck to the bottom of the sieve because the clumps are mostly broken up. All right, so now when I stir this, you can see now this looks like a glaze. It's really smooth and all of those clumps have been broken up and it looks like a glaze. So now that I have all of my dry materials hydrated, it's okay to take my respirator off at this point. Um, first I'm going to do a little cleaning up here.
And now I'm going to glaze two test tiles using my new test batch of glaze. I'm going to start by labeling the test tiles with my underglaze pencil. This is test tile one, and this is test tile two. So for test tile one, let me give this a stir just to make sure it hasn't settled at all. For this first tile, I'm just going to do a really straightforward one second dip in the glaze. All right, so that's test tile one. For test tile two, I purposely picked the tallest test tile that I could find. I'm going to do a one second dip all the way down as far as I can get it. And now that this first dip has dried, I'm going to do a, a second, one second dip, only I'm not going to go all the way down. I'm going to go about two thirds of the way down. And now that the second dip has dried, I'm going to do a third one second dip. And this time I'm only going to go down by about one third. So I'm going to put these into my next glaze firing. And tile number one is just going to show me a nice straightforward look at what this glaze looks like all by itself. And tile number two is going to give me a good idea of what this glaze looks like at different thicknesses. And this is the tile that's going to help me determine whether I need to add or subtract water to this recipe. I'm now done working with this for today, so I'm going to close it up with a piece of Glad Press and Seal. And then I'm going to go wash up all of these tools. Opening a kiln on any day is fun, <laughs> but it's never more fun than when there are test tiles inside. The anticipation of waiting for the kiln to cool so you can see how the tiles turned out is like that new toy feeling that you had as a kid. If you get really hyped for this, then that's when you'll know that you were born to be a glaze maker. <laughs> okay, so let's examine these tiles. We'll start with the straightforward single dip. Compared to the photo that I saw before I decided to try this recipe, my glaze is darker, warmer, and it's a little bit shinier and less matte. The photo that I saw beforehand was lighter, cooler, meaning it was more blue than green, and more matte. So this is what I was talking about when I said you can't expect a recipe to look the same for you as it did for somebody else. The differences that I'm seeing are probably due to the fact that I'm using a dark reddish brown stoneware. The photo that I saw involved a lighter tan colored stoneware. This means that this glaze is not so opaque that it completely hides the color of the clay. It is allowing the reddish brown color to show through and combine with the other colorants that we added to the glaze. And therefore it reads as darker and warmer. And as for why mine is a little shinier and less matte, matte glazes become more matte the slower you cool down your kiln, which means my kiln probably cooled down faster than the other person's kiln. Slow cooling is something I'm not interested in doing, so I'm just gonna accept that my glazes will be less matte and I'm good with that. Now let's look at this tile with the different thicknesses. It turns out there's an obvious difference between one dip and two dips. 
The second dip makes the glaze several shades darker and glossier. There's a smaller difference between two dips and three dips. I'm not sure if you can see it on the video, but I see it with my eyes. It's slightly darker and slightly glossier on the third dip. Also, when we look at the side with the stamp, the thicker application causes the glaze to break around the edges of the stamp and also on the edges of the tile. The glaze gets lighter and matter when it hits an edge. This didn't happen on the single dip application. I really like glazes that do this. When I see this happening, I start thinking of ways to take advantage of it. So let's say you get to this point in trying out a new glaze and you think the test batch is either too thin or too thick. The next step would be to adjust the water amount in your test batch and fire another set of tiles. If you're going to adjust the water, do so in 5 gram increments. For a batch this small, a 5 gram difference in water can make a big difference. And as you can see, after one day, the glaze has separated, so the water is now on top and the solids are on the bottom. So if you want to remove some water, it's easy to just spoon it off the top. Just take another small cup and use your scale to weigh the water that you're removing. And here's an efficiency tip. Let's say you want to try removing 5 grams of water and also 10 grams of water, so you can try out both of those increments. If you're doing that, remove 10 grams of water first, then stir the glaze up completely and dip your tiles. Then add 5 grams of water back to the batch, stir the glaze, and dip your tiles. And this way you can test both of those increments in the same work session. The wrong way to do this is to remove 5 grams of water, then stir the glaze and dip your tiles, because then you'd have to wait until the next day for the glaze to separate again in order to remove that additional 5 grams of water. So always stir up the glaze using the lowest amount of water first. On the other hand, if you want to test higher amounts of water, that's easier. Just add 5 grams of new water to this batch, stir, dip, then add 5 grams more of new water, stir, dip, etc. It's easier when you're already starting with the lowest amount of water. And of course, if you're going to be doing further tiles with this batch, your next tiles are going to be numbered 3 and then 4 and so on and you're going to take careful notes about what each number represents. I'm happy with these tiles though, so I'm ready to make a full-size batch of this recipe. I'm going to make a 5,000 gram batch, which is typical for a full-size batch. They can range from 2,000 grams to 10,000 grams, it all depends on the situation, but 5,000 grams is typical. I forgot to mention when I was talking about tools that you need a calculator. So add a calculator to your list of tools. This is 100 grams. So in order to make 5,000 grams, I need to multiply all of these numbers by 50. And then when you get to the water amount, multiply this by 50 as well. This is the water amount in grams, which is the same as milliliters. To convert this to liters, I just need to move the decimal point to the left by three places. And there's your answer, 6.25 liters. The process for making a full-size batch 
is exactly the same as making a test batch, except that everything is larger and it takes more time. Before I start, I'm going to point out that I'm working on tables that are the same height as my knees. And this allows me to do all of this while standing up straight, which is easy on my back. Do not try to work with buckets that are on the ground because you're going to hurt your back. Figure out a setup that allows you to stand up straight. So I've got my recipe. I've got my trusty stainless steel bowl. I'm going to turn my scale on. Put the bowl down and then hit the tear button. And now I'm just going to weigh out all of my ingredients exactly the same way I did with the test batch, except in these larger amounts. And before I start, I'm going to make one note about accuracy. When you're dealing with these larger amounts, you don't have to be quite as accurate as you were when you're making a tiny batch like this. So my rule of thumb is that as long as I'm within one whole gram of my target amount, then that is accurate enough for a full size batch. All right, so let me get this on and I'll get started. I took my pitcher and I measured out 6.25 liters of water and I put that in my second bucket. And now I'm going to pour all of my dry materials on top of the water. and I'm going to let the powders just start to sink down through the water and start to hydrate themselves. Okay, so now that most of the dry materials have become wet, I'm going to put on my, my extra long rubber gloves.
And I'm going to start to stir. And this is more obvious with the full size batch than it was with the test batch. You can really get a sense of how stirring is not going to get all of these particles to break up because they want to stay in a clump. And that's why they need to go through a sieve. So here's my full size sieve, which fits perfectly in a five gallon bucket. And this is where this pail comes into play. The pail with the side handle is what I think is the best tool for transferring glaze from one bucket to another when you're trying to sieve it. Okay, you can see like the clumps of materials that are still in there that we need to break up. Now to get this glaze to go through the screen, I'm going to put my hand down flat on the screen at the bottom of the sieve and do a motion sort of like this. Or sometimes I'll go like this. But the point is that I'm wiping my hand across that screen and that encourages all the glaze particles to go through. Um, also, I'm going to do this in real time. I'm not going to speed this up, so you can just so you can get a sense of how long it takes to do this. I work all of those particles through the screen. Okay, and now I'm going to use the pail to get some more glaze. Okay, and now this bucket is now light enough that I can pick it up and pour the rest of the glaze over. And I'm going to use the, the side of my gloved hand and try to scrape out as much of this as I can. Okay, I hope you can see that. That's, that's uh, clean enough in terms of scraping. Okay, so that's it for the first sieving. As always, I'm going to check underneath and make sure there's nothing stuck here and scrape off anything that is stuck here. And now if I stir this batch, you can see how much smoother it is now. But even though it looks pretty good right now, I'm going to do a second sieving because I think all glazes need at least two sievings.
And you'll see that on the second time through, it goes through the sieve a lot faster. Just trying to get out as much as I can from that bucket. Um, this time there's there's nothing stuck to the bottom of the sieve really. That is a finished full-size batch of glaze. So now I can take the respirator off. And there's one last thing to do here, which is to take the hydrometer and I'm going to take a specific gravity reading of this freshly made batch of glaze. So a hydrometer is a glass tube. It has a weight on the bottom and a scale on the top half. So I'm going to hold the hydrometer. I'm going to start putting it into the liquid and then I'm going to let go of it and let it sink down below. I mean, sink down as far as it's going to go and then rise back up to its final resting point. Now I'm going to make note of where that resting point is on the glass tube, All right? And now I'm gonna take it out and take a reading. So I'm not trying to read it at the deepest point where the tube sank. I wanna read it where it came to a rest, which is about that much further down from the end. All right, so if this is 1.4 and this is 1.45, I'm gonna read this as 1.42 which is the point where the hydrometer came to rest in that liquid, 1.42. So that is the specific gravity of this glaze. And I'm going to add that to the recipe. So specific gravity, 1.42. And now every time I make a batch of this glaze, I'm going to use the hydrometer to make sure I've got the right specific gravity or thickness and on a regular basis, as I use this glaze over the next weeks or months, I'll stir it up and make sure that the batch still has the same specific gravity. It's important to label both the lid and the bucket with the same name um, in case the lid and the bucket ever get separated from each other. And now all of the tools that I used can go get washed up. Okay, 
Okay, now I'm going to glaze a pot using my brand new batch of glaze. I'm going to start by glazing the inside of the pot by pouring the glaze in and then pouring it out. Okay, and now I'm going to dip the top part of the vase down to about the shoulder. Okay, and now that this first dip has dried, that means I can hold this by the rim and dip the rest of this vase from the bottom up. And now that this part has dried, I'm going to do a second dip of the top part of the base down to about the shoulder again. And the reason I did that is because I know from my test tile that a second dip makes the glaze darker and glossier. So I'm going to try to take advantage of that. I want to create a simple color block between two very similar colors, one that's just slightly glossier and darker. And I'm hoping this will give more depth and draw a little more attention to what I think is the nicest part of this form, which is the narrow neck and the flared rim. Oh, and I also know from my test tile that this glaze is likely to break on an edge, so I'm hoping it's going to break nicely around the edge of that rim. You don't have to use the recipe that I gave you. If you have a recipe that you really want to try, use that one instead to do this exercise. When you're done with this, you will be equipped for learning the rest of the subject of glaze making. There are tons of great resources out there to help you to continue down this road. I already recommended one great book. There are lots of good books written on this subject and other online courses as well. Please enjoy your newfound freedom and the excitement of exploration and the pottery achievements that are in your future. <laughs>